the management of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Purpose and scope. Severe preeclampsia and eclampsia are relatively rare but serious complications of pregnancy with around 5 over 1,000 maternities in the UK suffering severe preeclampsia and 5 over 10,000 maternities suffering eclampsia. In eclampsia, the case fatality rate has been reported as 1.8% and a further 35% of women experience a major complication. The confidential inquiries into maternal deaths persistently show substandard care in a significant percentage of the deaths. Introduction and Background Eclampsia is defined as the occurrence of one or more convulsions superimposed on preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is pregnancy-induced hypertension in association with proteinuria equivalent to greater than 0.3 grams in 24 hours with or without edema and virtually any organ system may be affected. Severe preeclampsia is variously defined. There is consensus that severe hypertension is confirmed with a diastolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 110 mm of mercury on two occasions or systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 170 mm of mercury on two occasions and that together with significant proteinuria, at least 1 gram per liter. These constitute severe preeclampsia. There is less agreement about the degree of moderate hypertension, which together with other symptoms or signs constitutes severe preeclampsia. A diastolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 100 mm of mercury on two occasions, and significant proteinuria with at least two signs or symptoms of imminent eclampsia will include many women with severe preeclampsia, although it is to be remembered that some women who present with eclampsia have no prodromal signs. An important variant of severe preeclampsia is the HELLP syndrome that stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. Ultimately, as many clinical criteria are subjective, women should be managed according to a careful clinical assessment rather than relying on overly precise criteria. Clinical features of severe preeclampsia, in addition to hypertension and proteinuria, are the following. Symptoms of severe headache, visual disturbance, epigastric pain and or vomiting, signs of clonus, papilloedema, liver tenderness, platelet count falling to below 100 multiplied by 10 to the 6 power per liters, abnormal liver enzymes, ALT or AST, rising to above 70 microunits per liter, and the HELLP syndrome. Assessment and Diagnosis Assessment of the women How should women be assessed at initial presentation? Although the classification of severity is primarily based on the level of blood pressure and the presence of proteinuria, Clinicians should be aware of the potential involvement of other organs when assessing maternal risk, including a placental disease with fetal manifestations. Senior obstetric and anesthetic staff and experienced midwives should be involved in the assessment and management of women with severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Some women will present with convulsions, abdominal pain, or general malaise. In these cases, preeclampsia should always be considered and the blood pressure taken and the urine analyzed. 
clinical symptoms are important components of worsening disease, particularly headache and abdominal pain. However, increasing edema is not in itself a sign that should determine management. Maternal tendon reflexes, although useful to assess magnesium toxicity, are not of value in assessing the risk of convulsion, although the presence of clonus may be. Continuous oxygen saturation monitoring with a pulse oximeter is valuable as it is will often give early signs of pulmonary edema. How should the blood pressure be taken? When taking blood pressure, the woman should be rested and sitting at a 45 degree angle. The blood pressure cuff should be of the appropriate size and should be placed at the level of the heart. Multiple readings should be used to confirm the diagnosis. Korotkov phase 5 is the appropriate measurement of diastolic blood pressure. The method used should be consistent and documented. Automated methods need to be used with caution as they may give inaccurate blood pressure readings and preeclampsia. It is important to standardize methods of blood pressure assessment with the women appropriately positioned. Multiple readings are required to accurately assess blood pressure because of natural variation. Automated methods can systematically underestimate particularly the systolic blood pressure. It has been suggested that mercury sphygmomanometers should be used to establish baseline blood pressure as a reference unless the automated machine has been validated in pregnancy. However, many units no longer have mercury sphygmomanometers and so a baseline check with another validated device would be an alternative. How should proteinuria be measured? The usual screening test is visual dipstick assessment. A 2 plus dipstick measurement can be taken as evidence of proteinuria, but ideally a more accurate test, either a spot protein creatinine ratio or ideally a 24 hour urine collection is required to confirm this. There is poor predictive value from urine dipstick testing. Approximate equivalence is 1 plus equals to 0 0.3 grams per liter, 2 plus equals to 1 grams per liter, and 3 plus is equal to 3 grams per liter. False negative as well as false positive rates are recorded with the use of visual dipstick assessment. Problems can be reduced by training. An automatic dipstick reader can overcome some of the observer error found with urinary dipsticks. Newer techniques such as protein or creatinine ratios have not been fully evaluated but may be a valid alternative. A level of 0.03 grams per millimoles appears to be equivalent to 0.3 grams per 24 hours. In view of the high false positive rates with dipsticks, laboratory testing, usually by 24-hour urine collection, is recommended to confirm significant proteinuria unless the clinical urgency dictates immediate delivery. How should the woman be monitored? The blood pressure should be checked each 15 minutes until the woman is stabilized and then every 30 minutes in the initial phase of assessment. The blood pressure should be checked 4 hourly if a conservative management plan is in place and the woman is stable and symptomatic. Assessment of the woman requires a full blood count, liver function, and renal function tests. This should be repeated at least daily when the results are normal but more often if the clinical condition changes or if there are abnormalities. Clotting studies are not required if the platelet count is over 100 
multiply by 10 to the 6th power per liters. Close fluid balance with charting of input and output is essential. A catheter with an hourly ureter is advisable in the acute situation, especially in the immediate postpartum period. In preeclampsia, there can be a rise in uric acid that correlates with poor outcome for both mother and baby. The rise confirms a diagnosis of preeclampsia and confers an increased risk to the mother and baby, but the levels in themselves should not be used for clinical decision-making. Renal function is generally maintained in preeclampsia until the late stage unless HELP syndrome develops. If creatinine is found to be elevated early in the disease process, underlying renal disease should be suspected. In severe disease, serum creatinine can be seen to rise and is associated with a worsening outcome, but renal failure is now uncommon in preeclampsia in the developed world, and when it does occur, it is usually associated with hemorrhage, H-E-L-L-P syndrome, or sepsis. A falling platelet count is associated with worsening disease and is itself a risk to the mother. However, it is not until the count is less than 100 multiplied by 10 to the 6th power per liter, there may be an associated coagulation abnormality. A platelet count of less than 100 should be a consideration for delivery. A diagnosis of HELLP syndrome needs confirmation of hemolysis either by LDH levels or by blood film to look for fragmented red cells. An AST or ALT level of above 70 international units per liter is seen as significant and a level above 150 international units per liter is associated with increased morbidity to the mother. The platelet count would have to be below 100 multiplied by 10 to the 6th power to support the diagnosis. How should the fetus be assessed? In the acute setting, an initial assessment with cardiotocography should be undertaken. This gives information about fetal well-being at that time but does not give any predictive information. Women in labor with severe preeclampsia should have continuous electronic fetal monitoring. If conservative management is planned, then further assessment of the fetus with ultrasound measurements of fetal size, umbilical artery doppler, and liquor volume should be undertaken. Serial assessment will allow timing of delivery to be optimized. The value of doppler in other fetal vessels has yet to be clarified. The main pathology affecting the fetus, apart from prematurity, is placental insufficiency leading to intrauterine growth restriction or IUGR. Intrauterine growth restriction occurs in around 30% of preeclamptic pregnancies. Ultrasound assessment of fetal size at the time of the initial presentation with hypertension, is a valuable one-off measurement to assess fetal growth. Growth restriction is usually asymmetrical, so measurement of the abdominal circumference is the best method of assessment. Reduced liquor volume is also associated with placental insufficiency and fetal growth restriction. Serial estimations of liquor volume can detect fetal compromise. Randomized trials have shown that investigation with umbilical artery doppler assessment using absent or reverse end diastolic flow improves neonatal outcome and serial investigations of this and other fetal vessels can be used to follow pregnancies under treatment and optimize delivery.